Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mandy Samasilubo, as I've been introduced. Um, I'll be giving a presentation on the waterless toilet with electrochemical disinfection and biomass combustion. Um, I'll first acknowledge our partners in the project, which are Duke University, Research Triangle Institute International, abbreviated RTI, as well as the Colorado State University. Dr. Brian Stoner from RTI is our PI on the project, and I, Mandy Samazuro, will be your presenter today. Um, I'm studying, studying towards a Master's in Engineering Management at Duke University. Our system is a waterless toilet design with the following main components. We have an ogre-based solid liquid waste separation, an, electrical, an electrochemical disinfection of liquid waste, and thermal, thermal drying and combustion of solid waste. Our energy is harvested using thermal electricity as well as solar energy. The, modular, the um, system is both modular and scalable. Our discussion will begin by elaborating on the solid waste treatment module, which is situated in the area indicated by the red ring on the picture. An overview of what happens in the auger um, system is that solids are being separated from liquids by means of a dewatering screw conveyor. They are, conveyed, they are conveyed along the screw where drying and combustion eventually takes place. Thus, the, process, the main processing steps, sorry, <laughs> the main processing steps in the auger is converting solid waste to fuel, <coughs> reducing solid waste to ash, and using the thermoelectric enhanced combustion add-on, which I'll talk more about in the project, um, further in the presentation, um, to generate emission reduction, for power generation and um, emission reduction. So the diagram you've seen is what our PI likes to call the, the pretty photograph, but this one is more um, of a conceptual schematic of what the system looks like. The schematic illustrates the efficiency of the system um, and how it enhances airflow and reduces odor. The black chimney enhances natural draft. The solar radiation enhances the draft and drying while the fresh air blows in through the door. Okay, going back to the solid waste treatment module, I'm going to discuss what it comprises of. So what you see firstly is the combustion stove with electrochemical um, injection module, which is um, that black box uh, that enhances the combustion. So what we've done basically for our combustion unit is use prior experience and technology, um, which is RTI uh, that has come up with the thermoelectric module and they have tried to um, come up with a system that will be used for this basic, for this technology. Um, so they're in the process of modifying that. And when it comes to the biomass combustion stove, we have partnered with Colorado State University, which has vast experience in industry and are industry experts in the field of biomass combustion. They do modeling of biomass combustion, uh, which is shown by these graphs over here. Um, they also do 24 hour lab tests of um, small stoves, which you see here as a small stove on a tabletop. And they've also sold over 300,000 units worldwide. So combined with their knowledge and expertise, as well as RTI's knowledge and expertise in the thermoelectric air injection, we've combined um, those two to form our solid waste treatment module. I'll now move on to the liquid waste treatment, which is also marked by the red area in the picture. What we're going to do with liquid waste disinfection is use electrochemical oxidation. We've taken E. coli, which is a pathogenic contaminant, to show the effectiveness of using electrochemical oxidation as a means of treating urine. The, con the first picture you see is E. coli um, and its configuration. Then you see in the second picture E. coli after um, the, the, the configuration of E. coli after chlorination. The third picture is the configuration of E. coli after using oxidation. 
And the third one, the fourth one is the Confederation of E. coli treated using electrochemical disinfection. So through these tests, we've been able to prove that electrochemical disinfection is more, is more effective in killing E. coli than the other treatments. So we also realize that urine is, in general, sterile, but the large number of viruses and bacteria present in the urine is normally because it's contaminated with feces. And the over 200 billion people that are affected by pathogens present in feces um, is because of other species also, uh, um, of other pathogens also present in, in the urine infected, um, in urine, and feces com contaminated urine. So in doing our research, we are aware of all the other pathogens that you see that are present in the urine, but we are looking at E. coli at the moment because it is easier to treat, uh, it is easier to test, and going further into the stages of our, of our progress and research, we will be looking at how to treat the other pathogens as well. <coughs> so the electrochemical um, disinfection module is a collaboration between Duke and RTI, and it's, a, it's, a, it's first generation and is currently set up in a laboratory at Duke. And it is, as you see in, in um, this diagram, it has three main components, um, which are this dynamox cell, which, which fits into this area of the module. The untreated waste would come in in this area. Right now in the lab, this is how it works, but it would be modified for the system. So the untreated urine would come in here, go through the cell where it is treated, and come out in this area. So we, we are currently running several passes of the urine through this dynamox cell um, until we get a retreated enough um, sample of, of the urine. <coughs> the reason why we're using boron dope down on electrodes is because of the three main properties. The first one being the inner surface with low, absor low absorption properties. This gives us results, um, this results in less electrode filing and improves efficiency. The corrosion stability property um, ensures that the, the surface is not damaged during operation. And then the last property, which is the one that we focus mostly on, is the extreme extremely high oxygen evolution over potential. This means that there's a large window operation, there's a large voltage operation window allowing production of extremely oxidizing species. What you see in the graph below is exactly what I've explained, that with increased voltages we are able to oxidize um, a large number of species. So the schematic here shows that um, the number of oxidizing species being produced during oxidation when we use electrochemical disinfection as the result of the larger overpotential window, um, as I've explained. But what we are noticing, which is a, a, large, a big concern to us, is that an increase in voltage does result in lower power efficiency. And we're concerned that the energy efficiency um, would be a problem later on because we harvest our energy using solar. So the more inefficient the system is, the more expensive the solar panel would have to be. We've done further investigations um, to look at the voltage that we're getting and how effective it is in um, treating the concentration of urine. So what you see here is a graph which shows the relative concentration of urine as a function of time. So we have organic destruction as a function of time. We use um, physiological saline co um, containing a calibrated concentration of organic dye, and we treat it using 12 volts, um, and, we, and we treat it using 10 volts, and we keep going lower to see how much time it takes to treat. And as you can see in, um, in this graph, with higher voltages, we are able to treat the um, urine or the dye in this case much faster than we are at lower voltages. This is a more schematic view of what I've just explained that shows that even at, uh, that shows that at four voltages we still aren't able to treat the organic dye even after a thousand and eighty seconds 
whereas with 12 volts, we were able to treat the dye completely after <coughs> 180 seconds. So how much energy is required to, to achieve this disinfection? The data shows that energy required to reduce the concentration of organics is a function of voltage used on the, electric, as on the um, electrochemical cell. So that's the graph that you see here. An interesting result, a result that, we, that we've been that we're observing is that there's a minima as a, there's an energy minima as a function of voltage which happens around the area of 6 to 8 volts. Yeah, which, which happens around this area. So even though higher voltages may ox oxidize the species faster, there is a cost in terms of the overall efficiency. So in the end, we're trying to balance the time that it takes to treat the liquid with the maximum energy that we can harvest from our solar panel. The latter impacts the size and the cost of the overall system. That is all that I have for you right now at this early stage of our technology research. But that, however, is not the end of my presentation. Although the majority of our funding um, is for the sanitation technology, we've realized that sanitation technology adoption is, a, is just as an important factor in the successful implementation of this technology. So we are looking at um, dimensions to sanitation adoption, and the ones that we have identified thus far are financial and supply chain um, related, economic related, political and public, and public policy related, as well as social and cultural aspects. We've just begun asking ourselves a few questions around these topics to get the discussions going. And as I'm part of um, a five-member team um, in the Masters of Engineering Management program at Duke, who are looking at the, solely at the financial and supply chain dimension. We are trying to develop a cost model for the system that answers these questions. <coughs> what are the components that are going to be used in designing and, man and construct in the construction of the system? What are their prices? Where are they manufactured? What is the cost of outsourcing versus um, getting the materials in the country of implementation? What are the manufacturing and assembly locations? Do we manufacture and assemble in a different location and bring the materials down assembled? Or do we assemble on site? What are the supply chain and distribution channels? What is the market structure and, and openness to trade in the country of implementation? And what operation and maintenance requirements are there? As part of my internship um, for the project, I'm also looking at the other economic dimensions. And my research question is what business model, as well as government policy and behavior changes, would be necessary in launching the successful, it will be necessary in the successful launching of this waste management system. So under the economic dimensions, the questions that we're looking at is what is the market size in each of the countries we're willing to implement? What are the investment and workforce requirements? What are the policy factors in terms of trade, investment incentives, regulation at different levels of government? And how does that affect our technology? What is the income generation potential of the byproducts? For example, we're looking at um, extra using the treated liquid waste for fertilizer. So how can that be a benefit to the users? The ashes that we burn from the combustion, how can that also benefit the user? We're also looking at affordability um, of households <coughs> as well as the communities at large. Under political and public policy, we're asking ourselves questions around political will. Um, also, who are the major role players in each of the countries, from national to local to, um, to provincial governments? What policies and what policies and, and enabling environments are there? What regulations, legislations um, to define standards, example, the use of byproducts exist in the different countries, as well as the business and management models? And uh, the social dimensions, the key questions we're asking are around gender, attitudes of men and women, 
cultural differences across ethnic and linguistic groups, and also taboos that exist that would end up being a risk to, our, to the implementation of our sanitation technology. We're also asking safety questions, um, especially when it comes to women and children, where we place the, the sanitation system, if it's a communal um, sanitation system, or where around the yard and the household it would have to be. What traditional practices do we need to adhere to in different countries? Other countries would prefer squatting and washing versus other countries that prefer um, sitting and using paper. How can we adopt our, our, our sanitation um, technology to, to accommodate all of these? We're also looking at prestige and aspirations. Coming from South Africa, we're well aware that um, sanitation is looked on as a sign of dignity rather than just a basic service. So what prestige and aspirations exist and what can we do with our technology to also encompass those. We're also looking at the general aesthetics, convenience, and geography. So in summary, um, our waterless toilet system, which has only been in research for a few months, is trying to look, um, look at an auger-based solid liquid solution, <coughs> electro use electrochemical disinfection of the liquid waste, and use thermal and, com and thermal drying and combustion for the solid waste, and harvest energy using solar and thermal electric electricity. We're trying to make the module both mod modular and scalable. For the dimensions of adoptions, of I, as I have explained, we are looking at the four main categories, which are financial, supply chain, economic, political, public policy, and social and cultural. Um, that is all that I have for now. And I'd just like to acknowledge that this work was supported through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and partial support from RTI International, um, the Fellows Program, and Duke University. Thank you.